So one of the first main overarching topics you learn about in introductory physics is projectile motion, this idea of throwing things into the air and watching the trajectories that they take. Well, this series, we're going to take a look at projectile motion from a computational approach. Your textbook probably goes over how to solve the problems algebraically. You might have a lab activity or two where you're working with projectiles physically, but looking at these things with a computational model really yields a lot of additional insight that I'm excited to talk about in this series. First, let's talk about what is a projectile. The idea is that you're taking some object. Uh, in our videos, it's going to be a ball, uh, but it could really be anything, anything that you are throwing into the air uh, that's going to arc through the air, come down and land somewhere, probably on the ground or in a basket or something like that. And so this thing over here on the left, this is the projectile. And we talk about its trajectory. We talk about the path it takes through the air as it arcs out of your hand or out of the launcher uh, and down to the ground. So this dash line here, this is what we're going to call its trajectory. And there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do with this problem and a lot of great questions that you can answer. For example, why does it get this shape? Why doesn't it just go up in a line and then down in a line? Why doesn't it just go up and then psh, fall down entirely? Why does it get this shape? If you solve the problem mathematically, why is it a parabola specifically? And what does it take for this thing to not be a parabola? Um, wh what determines how far the projectile goes, right? What determines how far along the x-axis it goes? What determines how high it goes, this sort of maximum height that you reach there at the top? And what determines how much time it takes for the thing to land at the end of its journey? Well, all of these answers are going to come from a consideration of the forces that are acting on the projectile. So what we're going to do is think about this projectile at a particular moment somewhere in its trajectory. So think of this blue here as being like a freeze frame on the, uh, on the projectile itself. I'm interested in finding out how far the projectile moves during that one frame. So here it is, uh, let's say at time t. I want to find out where it's going to be some small amount of time later. Let's call it t plus delta t, right? So the delta here just means a small bit of, right? The idea of delta is that you're, you're, you're taking your time value and you're just moving it forward a little bit. So this is a small bit of time forward into the future. We want to find out how far does it move and in what direction. What changes about it from going from one step to the next. Again, this is small, right? So the universe is going to operate on a scale of delta t equals very, 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 very small, possibly as close to zero as you can get. We're going to operate on a delta t of what we consider to be small, maybe a millisecond or, or something like that. What we're interested in looking at here is how the various properties of the ball change due to the forces that are acting on it. It's going to be the forces on the ball at this moment in this frame that determine how the ball behaves. So at a very basic level, we're going to have the force of gravity on this thing. It's going to point downward. And when we're close to the surface of the Earth, we're going to use a nice simple version that this is equal to the mass of the ball times the strength of the gravitational field. Now this G here, this is how strong the gravitational field is. This depends on what planet you're on. I think you're probably watching this on Earth. If you're watching this from Mars, I'm very happy to be getting viewers from Mars. Uh, this thing on Earth is around about 9.8 newtons per kilogram. If you're in a hurry and don't really care too much about the exact accuracy, that's going to be 10 newtons per kilogram. Um, that's how strong this force is. So I also need to indicate its direction. It's pointing down. So I need a negative to indicate it's going in the negative y direction. And we'll put a y hat on there to show it's going down. Y hat literally just means uh, the direction up. It doesn't really carry a numerical value with it. It's just a way of mathematically encoding that this thing is that, that it's a vector pointing up. And when I have a negative on it, negative y hat, 
is literally just down. That's all it is. It's, it's just a notation to indicate the direction. You're not going to plug in a value for y hat necessarily. And just with that one piece of information, I can start to figure out some information about my uh, about my ball going from t to t plus delta t. Because I start out with this ball having a velocity, right? I start out with this ball having a velocity, uh, let's say pointing this way. Let's call that v initial. And then later I might have it pointing with a different velocity. Let's call that one v final. Well, I can use the force to figure out what's going to happen to that velocity. Uh, you've probably seen at some point in your physics class this equation that the force that you have acting on the thing causes an acceleration on the ball itself. So we're going to rewrite this as acceleration equals 1 over mass times the force. I like it written this way better than F equals MA because this way illustrates that the force is the cause and the acceleration is the effect. Because the way the universe works is that there are certain forces acting on this projectile that then cause it to have an acceleration. So let's keep going with this. Um, I can use my acceleration to do something that we call updating the velocity. The idea of a velocity update is that I have the initial velocity. I've got the velocity just, be, just at the beginning of the frame. I want to get the velocity at the end of the frame. I want to get its new velocity. In order to do that, I just have to add on the acceleration times delta t. Remember, delta t is a small number. It's a millisecond or a microsecond or a nanosecond if you really want to get accurate. So a times delta t is going to be a small bit of acceleration or a small bit of change in velocity that's going to get attached onto vi, right? So this, this piece here is how much the velocity changes by during this frame. Then I can do something similar. I can do what's called a position update. And a position update works exactly the same way. I have my initial position, right? That's where it's located at the beginning of the frame. I want my final position. That's where it's located at the end of the frame. And I'm going to add on to that my velocity, again, times delta t, that's going to be the change. It's at this point, there's a little bit of an ambiguity in my procedure because I have two velocities for this frame. I have a v initial and I have a v final, one in the beginning, one at the end. It turns out, and you don't have to prove this, you can just look it up in the original paper, it turns out if you make this velocity the final velocity, the velocity at the end of the interval, then this procedure doing this update is a lot more stable than if you put in the initial velocity. It just has to do with how well the approximation accounts for all the energy in the system, stuff we'll get into later. But for now, just take my word for it that it's actually better to put in the final here rather than the initial. Ideally, it wouldn't make a big difference because if A delta T is a small change in velocity, then VF and VI don't differ by a whole lot. And so in principle, these don't have to be all that different. It just turns out in the long term to be better to use v final. And so if you're in a physics class, you've probably seen an equation like these. You've probably seen an equation like acceleration equals delta velocity over delta t. Or you've probably seen an equation like velocity equals delta position over delta t. If you're not working in vectors, if you're in 1D, then that's a delta x over delta t. Vector r is just the position vector to tell us x, y, and z in 3D space. Those equations are good and they are true, but they're not actually the way the universe works. The way the universe actually works is in these updates. Because the way the universe actually works is that there is a force acting on the ball. That force causes the ball to accelerate, meaning it changes its velocity. It changes it from v initial to v final. And that velocity changes the ball's position from ri to r final. So these equations outlined in blue are actually the way the universe thinks of these. The two on the left, the delta v over delta t and delta r over delta t, that's our definitions that we as humans need, but they're not really the way the universe works, even though they are mathematically equivalent. Now, here's the thing. I could take these and I could solve some problems with these, right? I could plug in some numbers for the force 
for the mass, the initial velocity, and the uh, initial position. And I could start working out some numbers to try to track where this thing is going in terms of its trajectory. But this setup, these update equations, are actually perfect for setting up this problem in a computer so that the computer does the math for us and creates an animation for us.